St. Francis of Assisi. Just about everyone knows about this Christian model of self-sacrifice. St. Francis is one of the most venerated religious figures in history. A little background. He was the son of a wealthy cloth merchant and even fought as a soldier for Assisi. While going off to war in 1204, Francis had a vision that directed him back to Assisi where he dedicated his life to following Christ, the rebuke of wealth, embrace the way of poverty, and a life fashioned after the Sermon on the Mount. St. Francis of Assisi has been a model of Christian living. Centuries later, Jamie Arpin Risi, along with his friends and neighbors of Little Flowers community in Winnipeg, decided to embrace the life of Christ with St. Francis of Assisi as a model. Subsequently, he authored the book, The Cost of Community, Jesus, St. Francis, and the Life in the Kingdom. Jamie Arpin Risi is with me now to talk about his Christian walk. Jamie, thank you for coming our way. Thanks for having me. This walk that you describe in your book is amazing, and I think it's very timely now, given our economy and how much we emphasize material worth in our society. But I want to hear about you first. I want to hear about your walk and what led you to follow this particular walk and an acceptance of poverty. My wife and I moved to Winnipeg's uh, inner city 10 years ago uh, at the invitation of the late pastor Harry Lahotsky, who uh, was a Baptist minister who, who just modeled uh, living among the poor. And he invited us to, to be there, but he said, if, if you're going to do ministry in this neighborhood, you have to become a neighbor, you have to live there. And uh, being a small town rural boy from northwestern Ontario, uh, urban life was new to me. And I was looking for examples of Christians who had, uh, had done this uh, throughout uh, church history. And one of them I kept coming across again and again was St. Francis. And what started as a, um, almost a, a casual pursuit of the life of this very unusual Italian uh, son of a cloth merchant uh, ended up uh, spoiling me for the ordinary and leading me to this way of life that was completely unique. Now this uniqueness of this life, Paul said clearly, I know how to abound, I know how to be abased, but unfortunately we do live in a society that we want to abound, we don't want to experience the suffering of being abased. Mm. In your book, you describe human suffering, and I, I'd like you to get into that for us, for all our viewers watching, because suffering is, as the word said, who, do, who wants to suffer? Mm. But there's a way to embrace that, there's a way to find meaning, mm. if you can tell us about that in your life and in what you've seen. Yeah, when I read the Sermon on the Mountain and, and Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, the familiarity we have with Scripture sometimes blinds us to somehow how audacious Scripture is. Really, are we blessed when we mourn? And, and I was trying to understand what did it mean to, to be blessed in our poverty. And I realized uh, through relationships with, with my neighbors that they, they were not any more broken than I was. They were not any more poorer than I was, but their material poverty uh, in some ways liberated them from the pretense that our wealth and privilege can sometimes have. We all are broken, we all are suffering from the consequences of sin in our life, but when we have wealth and privilege in our life, sometimes it blinds us to, it helps us mask that brokenness. And the freedom that came uh, for me living uh, in the community that I did was that I saw in, in them an authenticity uh, even in their brokenness, even, bef even before they discovered Christ, that allowed me to, to uh, invite Christ into that brokenness and share in Christ's brokenness. Jamie, tell us about your family. I mean, to embrace this on your own is one thing, but, but to be able to pass this on to a family, a precious family, mm. and walk in that as a group together. Tell us about your family. Well, my wife and I have, like I said, we've lived in uh, the, the neighborhood for the last 10 years, but we recently uh, adopted our first child, a little four-year-old boy named Micah. There's that picture <laughs> on your screen there. <laughs> we brought Micah home Lovely from Ethiopia uh, just three months ago. Oh, and, precious. Um, he is. He is absolutely precious and a gift from God. Um, he, he comes from a nation that struggles with poverty as well. Um, and uh, he is a reminder of, of God's grace to us every day. Um, but it's also tricky because how do you, how do you bring a child into a neighborhood that is characterized by poverty and crime, and yet um, it's also a neighborhood that's characterized by diversity, and uh, 
we love it. Our, our son is, lives, is growing up in a neighborhood where his parents are the minority and not him. And um, he, he speaks the language of many of our neighbors where we don't. So he's been wow. uh, a so real Wow, he's blessing. teaching you in some ways. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> he's been a great teacher. <laughs> <laughs> now, this, this walk that you discuss, and I, I love the way you describe that as a family unit because it, it's, it's so important. But again, we want to get back to the, to the model of St. Francis. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a single Christian today that doesn't, hasn't heard of St. Francis mm -hmm. and, and what it is that he, he preached, which was a long scripture. Mm -hmm. And he preached many things. Poverty is the one that marks him the most. Mm -hmm. But what is it about St. Francis that, that caused you to, to dig deeper to use him as an example. I mean, there are those that are watching that are saying, I use Christ as an example and that's it. Mm. But there's a reason that you use St. Francis, and I'd like to hear what that is. The reason I went to St. Francis mm. as an example was not as a replacement to Christ, but in fact because he led me so powerfully to Christ. Francis um, is not someone that I pursued because he somehow modeled Christianity in perfection, but because he pursued it in brokenness. Um, Francis uh, was unapologetically committed to living the teaching of Jesus as literally as possible, sometimes naively so, and yet that commitment transformed his life and the life of those around him. And he made mistakes, and he learned from those mistakes, and brought that to, to Christ and, and with God's grace continued on. And by following Francis' example, it reminds me, it, remi it has reminded our community that to follow Christ is it, it is an audacious thing to do. It is, it is absurd in the eyes of the world. And yet, if we're willing to be radical enough to do it, um, we can see our lives and the lives of our communities transformed. You talk about radical obedience. Mm. Tell us how that works. For me, radical obedience has meant taking Jesus at his word, doing what he actually says. And I think most Christians would say, of course I live um, the sermon, uh, Jesus' words. Uh, I take them seriously. I live them out. But sometimes I think through... Um, our cultures or our context, we've softened the blow, so to speak, of what Jesus calls us to. And for Jesus to call us into lives of, of shared brokenness and sacrifice and simplicity in a culture that teaches uh, ambition and wealth and power, um, it is quite a countercultural way to live, and, um, but truly a, a blessing to live it. You said something in your book that really gives perspective that God defies our expectations, mm. that He, God, imagine that, actually humbles Himself to get down to our life mm. in order to live and walk with us through our brokenness mm. and our lives. Yeah, I, I grew up um, with a good Christian home and a good Christian community, and I committed my life to trying to be Jesus to the people in, in the world around me, and that, that is a good thing to pursue. But when Jesus came and lived among us, when he humbled himself to become man, um, and, and as he teaches in, in, in Matthew about um, when we love the least of these, we love him, I realized that what I needed to change in my life was to also see Jesus in others. Sometimes when I came to people to try to be Jesus, I came with a posture of superiority. But if when I approached my neighbor as, this is, I'm approaching Christ, suddenly my posture changed to one of humility, to one of wonder to one of, of, of uh, service and it changed the relationships with my neighbors and it changed my relationship with Christ in a, in a powerful way. Now, how do you do this? Do they ask you questions? Do you just tell them? I mean witnessing is a major call in the Christian mm. walk but there are wise ways to do it. I mean yeah. what, what came as somewhat of a surprise because not too many people want to address this but your book addresses that about casting pearls before swine mm. which discusses specifically how important it is to have wisdom mm. in your approach yeah. to how you bring the Word of God to others. How do you do it? For our community, it's a commitment to live the gospel that we preach. We recognize that by bearing the name of Christ, um, we carry with us all the expectations people have for, for the nature of Christ. There's a popular motto that you hear often today that the world uh, loves Jesus but not so much the church. And sadly, that's a result of, of, of people seeing Christians who bear the name of Christ yet live lives that don't seem worthy of that yes. name. And so we recognize that in order to, to allow the proclaimed gospel, and we proclaim it unapologetically, but for it to have authority and for it to have conviction, we needed to also um, live the gospel in our life. Um, not in a triumphant way as, as though we have it, but often even in our brokenness by saying, you know, we, we, we don't have it together, but we have hope in Christ. And um, 
we have found that when people see that authentic expression of Christ, they're not afraid, they're not intimidated, they're not turned off when you, you know, shamelessly proclaim, proclaim the name and gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, we all know the serenity prayer and how difficult it can be to accept, mm. just accept the difficulties that come our way. Mm. For those who may be thinking, I didn't choose this poverty in my life. I, mm. I worked my whole life for my family. I find myself poor. My family is suffering. I didn't choose this. Mm. On that note of acceptance, what words of comfort do you give such individuals? The title of the book is The Cost of Community. And um, probably the greatest gift that I've learned um, in pursuing Christ's teaching is that he doesn't call me alone. He calls me into his body. We die to ourselves, but we are resurrected as his body together, united by the Holy Spirit as one church. And the brokenness that we live with does not have to be something that we privately deal with day to day, but rather something that we should bring to Christ, not only through prayer and relationship, but also through his community, the church. And when we share each other's brokenness, when we support each other in love, when we pray for each other so that we can be healed, that brokenness gets transformed into an opportunity to give glory to God. What is the cost of this? Do you, do you pray on a daily, absorb yourself in the gospel? I mean, this is not, can you say this is an easy walk for you? Oh, no, it's, it's definitely not. I, people ask me to characterize my, uh, our ministry, and I, I think the closest thing I can compare it to um, is marriage. And I apologize to any single <laughs> viewers who, who might not get the connection, but it is the best and hardest thing you will ever do in your yes. life. It demands so much of you. Everything it, in you. Yeah, it, it, it rubs on the raw edges, but in the end, what is produced is a, a, a diamond. <laughs> Jamie, can we ask you, what is produced is a diamond, so sure. <laughs> can we ask you to look at that camera and say a prayer for those watching that need that encouragement to go on in their daily lives? Lord God, we thank you for your grace and for your love. Uh, and we thank you that by your spirit, we do not have to live alone in the brokenness of sin, but that you bring us into the loving embrace of a father, uh, empower us by your spirit and make us one with your people. God, I pray that anyone uh, who is hearing this and is feeling alone, that you would quicken in them the spirit that unites us as one body. And Lord, that you would bring them into the lives of, of your church uh, for your purpose, God, so that your kingdom and your glory could be made known. All this we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. And remember, there is always great, great hope in the Lord. Jamie, I want to thank you for coming our way. You were very inspirational and a faith builder. Thanks. All the best in your work. Likewise. We're going to get to Truth to Go after this. Stay tuned.